you know, a lot of people might complain about how long or how elaborate these lockout tagout procedures are. And, and like you mentioned earlier, you got to fill out paperwork. You got to talk to someone. You got to get your lock. You got to put the lock on. You got to do all these steps to verify it. But at the end of the day, that extra time is always going to be worth it if you are safe and you're alive and not injured. You can't really put a, a time limit on something like that. Welcome to Eco Ask Why a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco SY. Today we're going to be talking about lockout tagout. What is that system? Why is it important? And what are some of the best practices in industry that we should consider? Today, walking through this topic with us is Mr. Jonathan Fuller, product manager out of South Carolina. Jonathan, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Hope you're doing good today, man. Not too bad, and yourself? Oh, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. So let's just start walking through lockout tagout. So when you hear that 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 term lockout tag out or lotto what comes to mind uh i mean so the first thing that comes to mind when someone tells me that is you know i picture a big lock on on a device that's keeping it locked out and keeping everybody safe absolutely absolutely i mean to me when i hear this it's all about safety and personnel and having people our heroes go home at the end of the day right no right. matter what equipment they're working on so when we talk about hazardous energy, there's a lot of different things out there that can hurt our heroes. What are some of the energies that, that we need to be aware of when it comes to a lockout tagout program? Uh, so, I mean, especially in our field of work here in the electrical industry, the most common one that everybody thinks of is electrical energy. Um, that can be the cause of safety concern. But there's actually a, a whole lot of other ones that a lot of people don't even think about, like uh, chemical or some big ones like hydraulic and mechanical or pneumatic energy as well. And then, you know, there's thermal and, and some other different ones, but those are some of the, the biggest ones. I hadn't even considered that when we were talking about this topic and setting it up to for our listeners together. I always just default because of the electrical background, working for Eco and the, the people we typically work with in industry just default to electrical. But right. I mean, the more you think about it, I mean, our heroes are working on a lot of equipment that could hurt them mechanically, or as you mentioned, from a, a pneumatic or thermal, hydraulics. Those are all important things to consider for a lockout tagout program, you know? Maybe give us a little example of what a typical lockout tagout in an industrial environment looks like. Yeah, so, I mean, you're going to have, you know, at your facility or something, You've got a, a machine or a press or, or something like that that you need to go work on because it's it needs its routine maintenance or it's down because of, of some issue that it's had. There's six steps that OSHA defines as part of lockout tagout. So the first step is going to be preparation. So you need to identify, all right, this is the machine that has the issue. This is what we're going to do. And you should have a written procedure for your lockout tagout as well as kind of your plan of work and things like that. And so then after that, you're going to also, during that preparation phase, uh, you're going to identify what something OSHA defines as an authorized employee. Um, so that's going to be the person that actually is going to be doing the work on the machine and, and working on this procedure, as well as you're going to have a, a team leader, that's somebody that's going to manage the whole procedure and, and manage the authorized employees that are working on it. And then your next step is going to be the actual shutdown. So you're going to go in and once you've identified all the different kinds of sources that are feeding that machine, you're going to go in and, and shut those down. So you'll you'll open your breakers or, or think valves, things like that. Once you've shut down that piece of equipment, step three is isolation. So that's going to, again, step two and step three go hand in hand that you're going to isolate that machine from any kind of energy sources, the most common electrical, whereas also pneumatic or hydraulic things like that so once you do that step four is going to be the actual lockout tagout so that's where you're going to have your padlock as well as you're going to have a, a tag and so this tag usually is metal and it's going to go through that lock off in a breaker and it's going to have several places to be able to attach a padlock to everybody that has a lock on that machine you're going to write your name on that tag and when there's locks in place you cannot open that tag to be able to access that breaker so 
Then you're going to go through step five, which is going to be a stored energy check. So you're going to go in and make sure that there's no hazardous energy still stored inside that machine, whether it be in a capacitor or, uh, or things like that. And if you do find it, you're going to make sure that you either uh, relieve that hazardous energy by discharge, or you're going to make sure that it's restrained or disconnected. Uh, and then the final check is an isolation verification. So that last step is just that double check. You've gone in and you've relieved that incident energy, you've, you've hazardous energy, you've done things like that to make sure that it's all locked out, tagged out. Now you're just going behind yourself and double checking to make sure that it is 100% safe for you to be able to go in and work on. Okay. So that'd be, sometimes I've been in plants, you've seen, you know, the posters inside the safety areas and things like that, lock out, tag out, try out. So is that last step, that try out verification? Yeah, absolutely. So you want to verify that piece of equipment that you're working on cannot be energized by any means. Okay. So when should we consider lockout tag out i mean at what point for any maintenance in the plant uh you know there's different people have different opinions but in my opinion you know safety is key and at the end of the day you want everybody to be able to go home to their families so anytime you're working on any kind of equipment that can be energized by electricity or any other of those means that we talked about earlier definitely want to do lockout tag out right now when you're doing this lockout tag out can you have more than one person participate in lockout tag out on a single piece of equipment yeah absolutely if you've got more than just one person working if you're working on a large press or or a, a whole line of something a printing press or a extruder or something that's going to be a large line yeah you definitely are going to have more than one person working on that as well as again that team leader so every person that's working on the piece of equipment authorized employee as well as the team leader is going to have a lock on that tag so you want to make sure that you have adequate number of locks and, and following that one lock one key one person rule very good i'm glad you hit it that one lock one key one person so what happens if at the end of the shift somebody forgets to remove that lock and that equipment needs to start back up what typically happens in that process? The most common thing and defined by OSHA is that lock has to be destroyed. So the most common thing is honestly just a pair of bolt cutters. So you're going to go, you know, if you can verify that the machine is ready to be started and that there's nobody still working on it and you verify that employee just went home and forgot to remove his lock or he's exited the building and forgot to move his lock then you can actually just take a pair of bolt cutters and, and cut that lock off and destroy it per the OSHA standards. And then you'll just have to reissue a new lock, a uh, new key to that person. Absolutely, absolutely. And Jonathan, I have some experience here. We used to have a service arm at ECO. We would go do you know, preventative maintenance on large large motors and things like that. And lockout, tag out was something we had to learn. We had to learn on the fly a lot of times because every plant, seems like they have a different nuances to their lockout tag out. Some want contractors to have certain color locks only. Some of them want their names on them and things like that. And we've actually had an instance where we're, you know, at the end of the day, the, the employee forgot to take their lock off. And that causes a lot of stress. You know, that, that equipment needs to come back up. And all of a sudden, whose lock is this? And verifying, okay, okay, this is this person's lock. They're not here right now. You have to go through that whole validation that, hey, they are effectively not on the prim you know, property anymore. So it is safe to, to take those bolt cutters, like you mentioned, and to get that lock off. And actually, one thing from a best practice standpoint that we had to start doing was the job foreman. So if you have a contractor coming into your facility and they have... 10 guys that, that are coming in to, to work on their equipment. There's, there's one point person for that t group of 10. And the way we did it was there was a, a separate little system to validate at the end of the job that each one of those locks had been pulled off so that equipment could start back up. And that saved us. We were able to catch it several times. If you had that one foreman who was over a set group of individuals they can catch it because nobody's doing this on purpose. Nobody wants to leave a lock on a piece of equipment at the end of the day and intentionally screw up something. But that just know that little step was a big one for us from a learning standpoint to get better at the lockout tag out procedure. So that's just one story or instance that, that I kind of want to share while we were on this topic. And Jonathan, what are some ways that you've heard of or 
things that where people get hurt when maybe they're not using the right lockout tagout or they've uh, kind of sidestepped the procedures, if you will. Yeah, so I mean, lockout tagout's there for a reason. It's been defined by OSHA, the governing body of health and safety in the United States. It's meant to be followed, and they've got those guidelines. And you bring up a, a great point in that every facility or every plant, every you know contractor, whomever, is going to have their own variation of that lockout tagout. But at the end of the day, it should follow as closely as possible to those OSHA guidelines to keep everybody safe. But you know, if you're not using lockout tag out, you could be working on a piece of equipment and somebody, Johnny Overtort comes and looks at the, the breaker and says, oh, this breaker's off. Why is it off? It's not supposed to be off. He can come flip that breaker and, and close that breaker while somebody's working on a piece of equipment that could cause the equipment to become energized. And if you're working on a press or anything that could cause electrical issues or it could cause other kinds of hazardous energy issues that could result in serious injury or even death. So that's, again, that's all the more reason to use lockout tagout to let everybody know that, hey, this machine is down and being serviced, one, but two, more importantly, to prevent that accidental energization of that equipment. Absolutely. I think one thing I'd like to add here, Jonathan, for our listeners is that, you know, if you're a listener and you're working on equipment, you need to have your own lock. And I've seen people do this in plants where they go work behind someone else. You know, I have it locked out, so you're good. No, not really. I want a lock for Chris, and you should have a lock for Jonathan, right? And that way, we're human. Mistakes happen, and, and oftentimes we harp on it on this show. The safety is number one, and a lot of times mistakes happen because we're short on time, or we have to fill out paperwork. We have to go talk to somebody versus I could just work on it, their lock and just get it done. Shortcuts aren't what keeps America number one in manufacturing. They're doing it right. the right way. And who's to say that when Chris is done doing work on the equipment, he doesn't realize that somebody else is working on the equipment, so he pulls his lock off because he's done. And then the other person that's working on it, they didn't have their own lock. So there's no way of telling that. And, you know, not to mention you know, the safety aspect, but it's also just the peace of mind. If I'm working on a piece of equipment, I want to have the peace of mind of knowing that there's no way that this piece of equipment can be energized until I'm physically done as well as everybody else. So it's just kind of peace of mind and assurance knowing that, hey, there's no way of this accidentally being energized because I'm working on it and it's got my lock on it. You got that right, man. That was perfect. That was perfect. So let's talk about the ownership of the lockout tagout program. Who typically owns that in facilities? So, you know, typically it's going to be uh, a little bit of everybody is going to be involved in that maintenance, especially and things like that, as well as management. But it's it's going to be those OSHA defined authorized employee, as well as the the team leader that are working on the machine. They're they're going to own it for that instance. But it's kind of it's up to to management and safety and maintenance to come up with that procedure for lockout tagout to implement it. So it it revolves around almost everybody at a facility. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Safety typically takes the lead. The safety coordinators at the plants and things like that. One of the the craziest ones I've been involved with on site with industrial and users is usually it's around two two uh, industries, and that's power and pulp and paper. When they have outages and you go in those control rooms, you've seen those lockout boxes, and those boxes will have just locks everywhere because typically if you're locking out a piece of equipment you can't really there's only so many spaces that you can actually physically put your lock so these these boxes are laid out and you're signing off on which box you're putting your lock on and that's designated to the piece of equipment in the in a plant so just from a coordination and organization standpoint it's a lot to keep up with so hats off to the heroes out there who have to manage these programs because, hey, at every outage, there's a potential for somebody to get hurt. And that's what these programs are designed to keep our heroes, like you said earlier, Jonathan, we want to go home at the end of the day. And, and that's what these programs are all about. So I've seen some very elaborate ones out there, down to some very simple ones where it's one lock on one breaker. That's a very simple lockout. But you got 100 people working on this piece of equipment. How are you going to lock that out? And that's where these more elaborate schemes come in place and keep everyone safe at all times. So, so yeah, absolutely. 
you know, a lot of people might complain about how long or how elaborate these lockout tagout procedures are. And, and like you mentioned earlier, you got to fill out paperwork. You got to talk to someone. You got to get your lock. You got to put the lock on. You got to do all these steps to verify it. But at the end of the day, that extra time is always going to be worth it if you are safe and you're alive and not injured. You can't really put a, a time limit on something like that. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Don't cut corners here. Uh, if you're listening, you know, please, this is, these were developed and they're in place for a reason. That would be our, our advice for sure. So Jonathan, Eco SY, we always like to get a why in for every show. Well, we've kind of walked all over this, but why is lock, lockout tagout important to understand and more importantly, to keep everyone safe that are in our plants? Yeah, at the end of the day, safety is key. Safety should be the number one priority of everybody. So it's in place for that very reason, to keep everybody safe and send everybody home at the end of the day. So that's why it's so important. Absolutely. Well, Jonathan, we really enjoyed going through this topic. This is a topic that's pretty close to me because I see that this brings so much value to people and it's keeping them safe out there, keeping our heroes safe, letting them go home at the end of the day. So I really appreciate you walking through this with us the expertise that you brought to this topic and again i hope you have a great day thanks chris you too thanks for having me thank you for listening to eco ask why this show is supported ad free by electrical equipment company eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends also leave comments feedback and any new topics that you would like to hear to learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E C O A S K S W H Y.com.